so you know you can dance if you want to. Uh, hello and welcome to the unofficial Unreal Engine podcast, where we talk about all things Unreal Engine and also zombie pumpkins. I'm your host Alex Coulomb, and next to me is a very special gre- gre- grest. Grest. Wow, <laughs> grest. it's been a little bit, guys. We've been <laughs> off for a month. Uh, welcome to season three. Uh, I'm not. I, I, I guess as per usual, I shouldn't introduce the guest yet. We should have a little bit of our our teasing word association, and then we'll do the proper introduction. But next to me is. Arturo. I'll tell you his first name. I wish I could roll my R's and make it sound all proper. But uh, Arturo, fantastic. welcome. Hello. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, it's. Uh, I think that your R's are exactly where they need to be. <laughs> very kind. Very kind. I'm jealous of everyone who can do a proper R roll. <laughs> uh, great. Okay. So we're going to dive right in. We've got a lot of really fun stuff to talk about. I've been looking forward to this episode uh, for a while. Um, I'm also going to give a little vertical scoot of Arturo down to give a better illusion that we are, in fact, right next to each other. Uh, fun fact for our longtime listeners, we're not actually in the same room right now. Jacob and I have never been in the same room. Most of our guests have not been in the same room. We are just very, very clever with uh, how we do our magic virtual production. Thanks to our friends at Light Twist for providing our virtual studio. And uh, please say hi to them if you head to Unreal Fest. We'll be talking about Unreal Fest. But first, let's talk to our guest. Arturo, we're going to start off with some word associations. I am just just going to say a word and you tell me the first thing or phrase, whatever that comes to your mind. Sound Perfect. good? Great. Home. Home. Uh, food. Work. Uh, pleasure. Food. Uh, Mexico. <laughs> Travel. Um, pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Virtual production. Virtual, uh, trendy. <laughs> Unreal Engine. Uh, basic. <laughs> UEFN. Uh, potential. Potential, nice. And then a few more open questions. Uh, how do you take your coffee, if you drink coffee? I do. You do, because you have it right, you have it actually, with you right I, now. Well, this is, <laughs> this is mushroom coffee. This is not what I usually drink. Uh, yeah. uh, well, I drink this in the afternoon, but in the, in the mornings, it's funny, I drink um, Turkish coffee. Turkish coffee. Very yeah. nice. Yeah, I started a, a while in the Turkish, Turkish coffee thing, and I've never looked back. It's fantastic. Yeah. That's really fun. Uh, as a person who has never been much of a coffee drinker, I do remember getting to visit Istanbul um, in 2008, and they were like, well, you have to try Turkish coffee. And it really was uh, something special. Uh, but I have I have left it as the special thing that I only had in Istanbul, and I have not had it since. So you're making me very nostalgic. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know what? It's interesting because I don't think I drink it the, the way it's supposed to be drink, drunk. You know, oh, like I, I do my own version because I do like a big 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 one is they're supposed to eat it like drink it like really small i do a big one like uh, americano size but <laughs> but a turkish style excellent yes. uh so what what's the turkish style again remind me of that well you have this little pot um that you that you pour the coffee the coffee is like super fine type of coffee and uh and and then you put it in this like pot and let it boil um uh, and then you pour it with with the remaining of the powder powder there. So then you have to drink it all the way up to the powder. You don't drink the powder. And then mm. suppose that you can, you know, and read the fortune and all that. I don't get that far, but I suppose that you can read your luck in this coffee as well. Yeah. Oh, very cool. I didn't know that. Uh, yeah. You're making me very thirsty. And um, I think also with your accent, like you can make anything sound like the most delightful experience in the world. So that's that's wonderful. I'm still trying uh, to lose it. So, yeah. so it's not, <laughs> I'm clearly okay. not succeeding on it. I, but. I'm going to put you on the spot and I want to hear your best like imitation of an American accent. Uh, I mean, it's I'm, I'm good <laughs> imitating something I just heard, like imitation of an American accent. Yeah. <laughs> like that. Yeah. But uh, that's as far as I can get. Great. Fantastic. Um, now we're going to ask you what your favorite time of day is. Um, I think it's uh, that golden hour. Mm. I think it's uh, probably a very popular answer. But it's, yeah. it's, it's true that it's, uh, it's, just, it's just beautiful. Mm. Um, yeah. Is there a place you remember ever being where it was like a particularly beautiful golden hour? You know what my f- my very, very favorite time of day has ever been? I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago that there was a, a some sort of haze here in New mm. York. <gasps> yeah, Some sort of like, like orange oh. haze. 
right? That uh, yeah. I don't remember why it was. I think it was the wildfire somewhere in Canada or something <laughs> yeah. that was coming here. And I remember the 7 p.m. lighting at that time, and everything, all the city was was like tinted orange. Yeah. And that was, I mean, I know it was for a, for a bad reason, but it was so beautiful, <laughs> so beautiful looking. So that was yeah. my favorite time of day ever. That's a really good one. And it, funny you bring that up. So I know exactly where I was that day because there was appropriately enough for our Unreal Engine podcast, uh, an Unreal Engine event being hosted by our mutual friend, Diana Dury Wachter in the city. And so I was there speaking about Unreal Engine stuff. Jim Ryder was there speaking about, or sorry, I was speaking about virtual reality stuff. Jim Ryder was speaking about virtual production stuff. And then we had different members of the city who were talking about um, education and public policy and all these ways that Unreal Engine is being used for some particularly novel use cases. And time and time again, people get br kept bringing up like what it looked like outside and how it felt like something that you'd render in Unreal Engine. Um, so that <laughs> was cool. True. Yeah, what a crazy day. <laughs> like yeah, a, it bit, felt a bit heavy on the explanation, exponential hype, but yeah. It was it was like an Unreal Engine render. Yeah, yes. yeah. I mean, I don't know about you, but I definitely find myself sometimes like critiquing nature and being like, I don't know, clouds, like that's a little bit much. You got to kind of pull it back a bit if you want us to believe that those are real, um, you know, because you just get used to like what, what makes a good render and image and uh, virtual environment. And sometimes the real world is stranger than fiction. <laughs> true, 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 true. Yeah. All right. One more question, then yep. we'll dive into a proper who's who. Um, when was the last time you had a particularly large belly laugh, something that just really made you uncontrollable <laughs> with your gut? Um, you know that I have this thing, uh, which is a bit evil in my history, but it's mm -hmm. I like to watch TV bloopers. <laughs> <laughs> and it's and you know I I worked in the I have worked in the broadcast industry for so many so many years. Obviously, right now we are like in different industries, but um, I know how is it to produce a live show, and I know the, the 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 tension and everything that's going in a live show. And I have found myself in the last the last few years that I enjoy and I really really laugh from the bottom of myself when I see like these these funny bloopers. <laughs> Of like studio <laughs> studio production, <laughs> I know it's a bit evil, but it is it is true. Like I, I um, between that and uh, today today, I remember my well, a kind of frustration with with Meta that they don't believe that it's me that I'm opening this new account for for <laughs> Cash Interactive and they don't believe it's me and I've been back and forth with them to the point is like. I'm just laughing about it. <laughs> yeah, of course. So if it's oh, uh, someone from Meta, I, uh, it's, it is me trying to open that account. <laughs> we'll yes. make sure they see this, especially coming up on Meta Connect. Yes, exactly. um, in fact, our, our producer is at Meta Connect right now doing the, uh, the summit ahead of time. And he's very kind to be like, I want to get this episode out. So he's going to work on it, uh, even while surrounded by a lot of crazy stuff going on at Meta Connect. Um, so what's interesting about that to me as well is I was just talking to my kids yesterday about the early Pixar movies. And I don't know if you remember, like, I remember Toy Story 2 in particular, like they used to actually do bloopers of, you know, the Pixar characters, which was yeah. really kind of this novel thing because, it's you know, they're just they're not real, but uh, they made it so believable. The idea that they'd like accidentally knock something over or get tangled in some cords. And I kind of miss that. Like, I wish Pixar still did that. That was really fun. I mean, I think I think every single uh, show should have something like that. I mean, it, it really brings a, a lightness of the production, right? It yeah. brings like the idea of, yeah, I mean, there's, we're all humans working behind all this work and, um, and uh, it really relaxes the production. So I think that we, we see more of that like blooper uh, culture, but we'll see. I hope we, we can get some bloopers out of this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I would be absolutely thrilled. And take note, Alan, uh, our producer friend, uh, we already have some pretty good bloopers. And if we wanted to start putting that into a reel, that would be great. And it would be wonderful to make Arturo laugh. Uh, <laughs> wonderful. Well, let's dive into a proper interview. Welcome to my good friend Arturo Brena of Keshframe Interactive. Um, I, I like to start off by kind of saying, here's how I became introduced to this person. Um, it felt like I should have been introduced to Arturo earlier because we actually had a number of mutual friends, including uh, Rob Lester, who I've talked about on the show before, but I became aware of him at an event uh, that was kind of like a mini Unreal Fellowship for advertising executives. 
um, that a, a few folks we've, we've had on the podcast and talked about were also at. We had um, Ed from CG Pro and whatnot who were there. And Arturo was there, and correct me if I'm wrong with any of this, talking about uh, Thief and virtual production and the Unreal Fellowship. And uh, Diana and Julie Laudering and everyone were saying all these amazing things about what you, you and your company did and what an incredible experience the fellowship was for you. And then I got to chat with you afterwards and just had a, a wonderful time. And I got to hear a little bit more about your background at NBC and all that. But it's all these like little bits and pieces. And then, of course, I started to follow you and your company much more and have been you know thrilled and inspired by all the amazing work you've done uh, since then, including your most recent release. Uh, what did I get wrong and what should people know besides that? <laughs> I mean, I think I am actually very impressed that you remember ex exactly all that. I mean, I do I do remember that, that event. I remember, of course, talking to you, which was the highlight of the event. Um, I didn't remember all the, all the what it was about and anything like that, but I'm very impressed. Yeah, I mean, um, well, there's, there's, there's a lot to say. It's, it's a, I can probably start from, from how I got into this and, and where, where I am who I am and, and all that. Um, so I'm Arturo Brena. I, I, uh, I am currently the, the CEO, a creative, creative director for Cash Frame. Um, but I, how I got here, or what is it? Uh, so basically, I started my career. I'm from Mexico, and my accent. <laughs> I, am, I am from Mexico City, born and raised there. And I, I, I actually started on the engineering side. I studied computer engineering. And uh, this is a funny story that I don't know if, if I told you, but I actually, I studied computer engineering and, but in the first two months of college, I entered, uh, by mistake, I entered a design conference. And I remember this is in 1990, that's how old I am. This was in 1996 <laughs> uh, or something like that. And I remember that I entered this conference and I saw this walrus like this, like CEO, CEO Walrus singing opera, right? <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, what is that? And I knew that I wanted to, I was going to the technical side of computers. So I was studying engineering for that. And I remember seeing that and someone told me, oh, that is computer animation. I'm like, what? You can do that <laughs> with computers? Like I, for me, computers were like mainstream and databases and all these kind of things. And so I'm like, what? You can do this with computers? Yeah. Like, okay, that's it. And I knew, and actually my mom can tell this story. I, I came back home that day and I said, I know what I'm doing the rest of my life. And, wow. and that was my, my introduction to, to animation. So that's, so long story short, uh, a, a year later, while I was studying, I, I decided to intern, uh, unpaid intern for the network in Mexico City called Televisa, which is like um, the, uh, kind of the biggest network in, uh, in Spanish speaking language. And I was interning there, but at the same time that, they, that I was starting with them, they were doing the transition from this old animation software, like it was called Advanced Visualizer, and like all those uh, kind of old style software to like Maya. And so they were making this transition and I was lucky enough that I was during the transition. So I got completely obsessed and I learned Maya up and down and left and right. And uh, to the point that I end up Kind of teaching some like internal Maya uh, clinics inside inside there, and they were like, "Huh, oh, this kid learns really quickly. Why don't we put him to learn everything that comes?" <laughs> right? So then it came <laughs> like real time systems, and that was the very first time that I was introduced to real time systems. That was in around uh, two thousand, no, around nineteen ninety nine or so, which was uh, at that time peak Everest, which now is called VSRT, and uh, and for me it was shocking that you could do all these things rendering in real time, right? And back then and in the 3D. So, and that started my passion for it. And then a, a few, a couple of years later, I, I, I created a department in there. I obviously climbed up over there and I created a, the department of a real time technology for sports. And a, I started doing a lot of international projects with a, related to sports in the field of real time all the, the, the precursor of what is called now virtual production, which we used to call it back then, the a magic window or the virtual mm. window, I think, which was yeah. the same thing. It was like a LED screen and you will track the graphics and all, all that. And then I, I met this company called Orad. And that's when everything changed because Orad was a developer of real-time technology. They had their own render engine. 
now now they were bought by Avid, um, and it's a graphics division of Avid. Uh, and with them, I came to New York, right? And I opened their offices in New York, and my biggest client was NBC. Mm -hmm. um, so what we year went, are we right now? Sorry? What year are we at right now? Uh, this is 2007. Mm, so right. I was in Continue. Televisa for about mm, eight or nine years. Mm -hmm. And then I came to Orat for one year. And then I, I, I was hired by NBC because NBC got, bought a lot of Orat systems. And they bought me with the systems, right? They say like, well, this is a new technology. We need someone that can do it. So then they offer me a job. And that's how I joined NBC with a similar position of, of uh, managing their real time and 3D departments. And I was there for about seven years. And then uh, I, but that time when I, 2016, I had already about, I was 18 years in corporate. And, um, and I said like, it's now or never. You know, so I ventured to the wild and I decided to, to, um, open, open cash frame, which has been now alive for seven years, so almost eight years. And yeah, that was a story, <laughs> really long story, but of Arturo getting to where he is right now. <laughs> yeah. And please tell us the story also of why, uh, cash frame. Mm. Uh, why, why the name or why? Yes. Why the name? Oh, okay. So in the transition between leaving NBC, cleansing myself out of, I wanted to like do a fresh start of, to my career. And so I went into a meditation retreat, right? Mm -hmm. And it was a, a Vipassana retreat, which is this retreat in which you can, it's a silent retreat that you are for 10 days medita meditating. And the only thing you can do uh, every single day is to meditate for a minimum of 10 hours, right? Wow. So, so you can imagine that you go through every single thing of your life, right? And one of the biggest things that they promote, well, not promote, but that, that, that follows in this, in this practice is the con concept of impermanence and, um, and that every single moment arises and dissolves, right? So every single a moment is it's, it's a combination of little moments and they just arise and dissolve, right? So for me, that was so significant that I said, like, you know what? I want that every single frame that we create is inspiring. Mm. So then the word cash is a Mayan word that means, uh, it means many things, but one of them is, is uh, inspiration. Yeah. It's a type of inspiration or a, 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 the act of getting inspired to do something, right? Um, so then I wanted to select every single frame we create, we, I wanted to inspire that. So that was, that's the name, Cash Frame. Amazing. Yeah, it's a, a great story and a great title. I've always loved the idea of doing something like a silent meditation retreat. I, I would say like, oh, I've never had time. I think, frankly, I'm just a coward and haven't uh, made myself do it. I think I'd probably get a lot out of the experience. It is, it is, uh, it is an intense experience. I remember when then what someone asked me when we finished was like, what do you think about the experience? I was like, well, I think uh, everyone should do it. Well, mm -hmm. But, but it's not for everyone, yeah. if it makes sense. Like, I think that everyone could get benefited of it, but I don't think anyone can go through it. Because it is, when, when you are let, let alone with your own thoughts for such a long time, I mean, it's a very, very um, intense experience, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, that takes us um, up to, what, about 2017 or so? 2017, mm -hmm. um, that's Cash Friend got started. Yeah. And, and yep, go ahead. I was going to say, were you using things like Unity or Unreal, any kind of real time software at the beginning? What kind of projects and, and early tools were you using? And let's go up to the point where you started to use Unreal Engine in a really meaningful way. OK, uh, I mean, we were, as I was managing real time graphics for NBC, uh, we, we were using mostly the broadcast side of real time graphics, right? So mm -hmm. VSRT, uh, ROS. Uh, or add all those type of softwares, which was, mm -hmm. which basically was a, 
it's a, it's a, it's another version of what Unreal does, but it's optimized for the broadcast workflows, right? Mm -hmm. So it has things like very heavy amount of that data integration for control rooms and for the people that don't know these systems. It's basically it's like a it's like a version of Unreal, but it's mostly for data and data visualization and things like that. They now they started to combine it with more realistic stuff, but it, it was just to be like that. So we were doing services of that and then of concept design and 3D animation design, right? So uh, I I was really I really wanted to do the shift out of just real time and started to do more artistic things. That was part of the, the reasons that I wanted to pursue. So then we started doing a lot of concept design. We did some concept design with for some of the uh, events, sport events, Super Bowl, uh, uh, but more now as our clients, right? So no working uh, uh, with the network. So concept design and high-end 3D for broadcast. And, and that's how it started. Uh, until 20, I would say 2019, mm -hmm. I had started my, my playing with uh, real-time engines because while I was at NBC, we were doing, my department was also in charge of the news reenactments. So we were finding a way of, of doing like reenactments for news, like really quickly, because for, for a reenactment in news, you have about from the zero to a hundred to when it goes on air, you have around two hours and a half three hours, right? So then you have to create animations extremely quickly. So we were started playing with gaming engines back then, but, and we did mostly Crytek just for some, some tests. But then uh, I think 2017, when I went to NAB, that was when I saw the first time on Real Engine because Zero Density was presenting their virtual set. And it was the first time that they, it was a gaming engine in a, in a broadcast environment. And for me, it was like shocking. And uh, so that was stick, stick in my head until 29, like forward to 2019 when I retake it. And actually with Rob, uh, Rob Lester, fantastic genius guy, uh, <laughs> yeah. and a good friend and Matt Cornelius as well. We said like, well, I, I told him like, why don't we create a real time character uh, for broadcast? Right. And I don't know what got into us, but we got like all into it. And we spent months <laughs> building these like real time character for broadcast. And uh, we presented it to Televisa in Mexico. So we flew to Mexico to like build this production to present it over there as a TV presenter. And it was, it was very, very uh, one of the, of the highlights of, of my career just because uh, we took that risk and we we follow through yeah so and that's from that point we got a mega grant and that's what it started our our deep unreal stuff yeah what were some uh, surprises about your early days in unreal engine were some things easier than you expected harder than you expected etc well i think that the hardest part and i think it's the hardest part still for a lot of, of artists so transitioning to gaming engines was to understand the workflow, to understand the difference with traditional gaming engines. So, and it happened to me as well. I was very used to the idea of, okay, you're creating something very linearly in which you will, will, will uh, render it and then put it into like a very linear process. Um, and even though I had experience doing real time from before, which it was a very specific set of real time that was data driven. But here it was mostly about creating 3D finished pieces but with the real-time workflow. And that switch of mentality, I think that was the, the most challenging at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, blueprints, for example, everyone would say that was the most challenging, but for, for me, because I came from a programming background, for me it was actually a super good and easy transition to that. Mm. Um, so I, I loved it from the beginning, blueprints. I said like, okay, this is fantastic. Yeah. Does now make sense to talk about your experience in the Unreal Fellowship? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Wow. 
another one. And, and for and for context, by the way, so our season finale, literally the the last episode of what we did, was mm-hmm. with a bunch of the graduates of this most recent Unreal Fellowship, the Games Fellowship, which was my first time being involved in that at, at, at all um, as a teacher, and I was kind of blown away by the whole process. So I'm particularly curious to hear about your experience, and then we can kind of compare uh, what it was like compared to this Games Fellowship. Was yours the uh, animation fellowship was a uh, storytelling storytelling that's right yes yeah which i think it was it was a very special one i mean obviously we all think that our 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 <laughs> one is the most special one but i think truly it was very special because it was was not so much about learning on real which obviously you were going to do but it was a heavy heavy uh, emphasis in the story right mm. and which for me was exactly what i needed and I will mention there's three or four projects in my entire career that have like marked me, and this is one of them for sure. It was it was a a very 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 beautiful and very challenging and very at the beginning daunting experience, but it's definitely one that will stay and that marked a different pieces of what what happened in my career. Yep, from that moment. Um, I mean, you want to talk about what is the process of, of, of the fellowship itself I mean, for the people that don't know, but well, basically in that one, you were given and they will not tell you anything. And then you were giving the topic or the theme of the short that you had to create, uh, with a minimum of one minute and maximum of three minutes. Uh, and you had to create everything from writing the script from a uh, building everything, environment, uh, uh, characters, uh, animation, story, script, music, everything in one month, right? I believe that now they are a bit more directed, the fellowships, that they are like with pieces of stories and then they link them together or something like that I've seen. But in that, in that one was still kind of the past generation, I think, that it was the entire story was you had to create it by yourself. Um, and then you're giving this topic and then you are uh, driven through different classes that are related to that from in that one with the content of storytelling. So there are some classes on storytelling and some experts in storytelling and also teaching you on real at the same time. Right. So that, and that is a process that was for me, mind blowing, uh, taking it in one month from zero to a hundred and letting Letting it be yours. I remember this story um, in which in some point I was really blocked with my story, right? Because, I mean, I was an animator I, and, a, and a 3D expert and all that. Well, I don't like the word expert, but a 3D <laughs> artist, right? And subject matter expert. <laughs> subject matter uh, aficionado, I would say. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, so... And I, and, and I was so impressed with the caliber of people that were there, right? So I come from broadcast and there were people from film and from, from uh, big studios and so on. And I remember being blocked with my story and I spoke with uh, uh, Brian Paul, hmm. which he was kind of the, he's an institution. Anyone that knows anything, uh, anything about the fellowships, he knows who Brian is. And uh, he was basically kind of the head of the fellowships at that time. Mm-hmm. And I told him, like, I'm really blocked with, with what in the story. And I remember he said something along the lines of, well, it's, it's yours. It's your story. You know, just make it about you and about something that it touches you personally. And that's how The Thief was born, because uh, in those, around those years is when I started the process of therapy. And I, for me, it was very shocking how you could, like, go back in time in a, in a strange way and like kind of heal the things that you've been, been carrying. So I wanted to portray that experience through, through the thief. And, and that's what I ended up doing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, so we're having a great conversation about Unreal Engine. We're doing the homework assignment. That's all fantastic. The fact that you've brought up um, a silent retreat and therapy, I do want to kind of d- go on this little detour for a moment about like, 
what those things mean to you and the value that you think there is in kind of being more introspective, reflective. Um, I think it's something that I'm very interested in and I'm, I'm always fascinated in people's personal journeys with that. So whatever you're comfortable sharing, um, I'd love to hear more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that uh, I'm, I'm comfortable sharing. I mean, we are, we are all the result of the experiences we've had, uh, good and bad. The, we carry a lot of uh, what is given to us by, by uh, whoever raised you. Um, and in some point in the process, when you start in the process of, of um, redefining, I feel what is like the second, the second I call it the second wave, uh, mm -hmm. um, but the second part of your life, right? Um, and that you start accepting a lot of th things about yourself and you start going through that process, I think uh, it is very healthy to have uh, some method methods or some ways of uh, self-reflection and, and, and analyzing yourself and how are you perceiving things about the world, your work, your relationships, everything. And there's no real, there's no many mechanisms in, in our society that we can do that. You know, even if you go with friends, you're like, yeah, well, I, I share with my friends, right? And they give me advice. <laughs> yeah, but there's always with friends that they, or, or of course they want your best. So it's not someone that is completely unbiased. And also it, it, you, it's a, there's a social thing in which everyone's waiting for their turn to speak when you are talking to someone, right? It's the most common thing. We are educated that way to make them feel people that you're engaged and so on. Um, and then discovered that in therapy and other things like meditation and so on, that doesn't exist. It's just about the process. It's just about you and you going through your own process. And I thought it was very, very rich to do that. And I thought that, uh, so that's why I, I see therapy and like meditation and, and self-knowledge in general as something that um, anyone has to Anyone has the ability of exploring and anyone, there's no way you're not going to be benefited by it in, in any way, right? So, uh, yeah, that was my, my process and I got into it kind of late in my life. I didn't know about it because in Mexico, I feel that in Mexico, it was still a bit taboo, um, at mm -hmm. least when I was growing sure. up, like that you will go to therapy when there was something wrong with you, right? Mm -hmm. And And then I started realizing that I... <clears throat> Sorry, I moved to New York, and in New York, everyone goes to therapy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> and then I started switching my mentality about, is, is like people that want to get their, their body strong, they go to the gym. Mm -hmm. And people that want to get their mind strong, they go to therapy. Yeah. Basically. That's so, a great way to put it. Yeah. Excellent. And obviously, of course, we've mentioned the silent retreat uh, inspiring the creation of Cash Frame. We just mentioned how uh, uh, your experience in therapy was part of what led to the thief. I'm also curious to hear about, as I'm sure a very busy guy with a lot of clients and a lot of things going on, um, Does do you think that this also helps kind of center you? So when you do have a huge project or or something really monstrous you're trying to tackle, that you're able to get in a, in a healthy headspace to take on these larger challenges? Yeah, I mean, yes, yes, it does help. And I thank God for having a little bit of that uh, practice to keep me calm. But mm -hmm. I have to, I, I would not lie. I, when I'm in projects, I usually neglect my, <laughs> my Zen <laughs> side sure. and I go so full on and I'm like working a lot. And, but then at least I have a methodology that if if I start getting, I realize that I start getting very stressed, and I realize that I'm I'm very mentally mentally um, a, a tired or something like that. Then mm -hmm. I have a methodology that I can go back and okay, let me do something that I know is going to calm me down, and I know it's going to center me again. Because it is true that when you are stressed or when you are in a rush or when there's money involved, when there's personalities or whatever, especially in in the type of work that we do, which is client based, right? It's it's uh, clients all the time. Uh, so then uh, it, it is true that sometimes the stress gets to you and you need to have a way of taking the press pressure out and 
luckily I didn't I didn't choose the path of anything unhealthy, right? <laughs> uh, so, but this is the way I found, and I I take that pressure out by doing something. Some people, a lot of people, do it with exercise, mm. um, and I think that's fantastic. And I wish I, I would, that I would be like like a, <laughs> a bodybuilder <laughs> right now, but. Uh, no, I do it with introspection. I think that I am, uh, by nature, I'm more, more of an introvert, mm -hmm. but I, I am a, a trained extrovert, right? Mm -hmm. I know how yes. to <laughs> conduct myself in, in, in that, but I think that it takes a little bit of effort out of me. Uh, but it is, it is more... Um, so yeah, I found that introspection for me is a way to stay balanced. Yeah. That's really excellent. Before we dive into um, this incredible UEFN project, that's kind of the thing we were waiting for before having you on the podcast, um, I'd like to do a little bit of this yin-yang discussion of working on a client project versus a project that you uh, come at with your own you know, goals and priorities. So what I want to do here for a moment is I'm going to go back to um, your lovely page of projects. And if you wouldn't mind, let's just try to pick one of these and as much as you're able or comfortable talking about mm -hmm. you know we've got stuff from the super bowl and the u.s open and, and crazy things like that um i'd love for you to just give us a little bit of a walkthrough of like how the project came about what the process looked like how you respond to a client's needs and that sort of thing um yeah i mean um i mean we can go maybe you want to go first a client one or first a internal one let's start with the client one um yeah, I mean, we can we can probably do probably the latest one we did, which was uh, the Super Bowl with CBS. So if you go up, yeah, uh, or three right here, yeah, maybe that one. yeah, yeah, the one that one, mm -hmm. great. Um, so that was a, a fantastic project. I mean, I I truly truly, I've been I had been wanting to work with uh, Komal and his and, and her team uh, for a long time. Is the art director of CBS and. Um, this was a very interesting project because uh, we were brought uh, a little bit like uh, towards the end of it, and and the way we usually approach there's usually kind of two sides to it, right? One one side or two type of projects when we do these type of things with clients. One is in which we are in charge of creating the seed of the project, right? Which was, for example, the case with the Super Bowl with NBC or or the British Open, or some of those projects, right? And then there's the other side in which we are kind of joining a team that ha have already a concept. So talking about the, the way of the difference with client work, in this case, we, we came to a, a project in which we were in charge of doing the a virtual production side of it, um, but there was already a graphic look established, right? Mm -hmm. we, we're talking about... This was one month, around one month before the Super Bowl, uh, in which we got like a go to to produce this, and it was a very tight schedule. And but and having a and this is where it's very important having a good client that trusts you and that has your back and has the best the interest of the project in mind and that can provide you like with whatever you need and can help you and can. And, uh, and that is uh, is fantastic. I think that, uh, and we were lucky to have that with CBS and and uh, with Komal's team. And we also uh, created for this project two things. One was the virtual production side. So basically all the environment that we received um, on real engine scene that they worked on before, but it was not really optimized for ICBFX. So we had to basically mm -hmm. rebuild uh, that scene just to put it, uh, to make it perform to ICB for ICBFX, because um, at the beginning we didn't know this, but uh, <laughs> CBS shoots at all all their production is at 60 fps. Oh, so ah. uh, we had to make this perform as you well know for to go through and display and all that it to double our frame rate, right? So it was very challenging to to get it. We had this huge massive. On real engine scene, you can see it there, um, in which it, it, it had to be performing in like really, really <laughs> high, high uh, frame rates. So yeah. we had that side, and on the on in parallel, 
uh, talking with CBS, they say like, well, you guys do also 3D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, can you guys do the versioning of the 3D package, right? Mm. Like they had, I believe, two fresh creative. I, I believe there were them. I hope I'm not mistaken. But I think they were the, the creators of the with CBS. They had the kind of the seed of the of the look with so they have some renders and some examples with some teams. And then we had to take that that idea and then version all the rest of the logos, right? As the tournament was doing. So this is more or less like but this this was like an ideal client, right? In which you get all the support, you get all the assets, you get the trust. And you get a lot of of um, uh, support in making these. For example, these frames. Every single time we do an ICBFX project, and we are doing the environments. What we deliver is we deliver obviously the Unreal Engine environment and all, but also we deliver an cinematics or animatics of how of examples of how the the talent should be moving, right? So that will help a lot during the shoot to see like oh. The art side is, is, says that the lighting should be like this and the position of the camera should be like this. And we, we've always find that that helps a lot to, to illustrate during the virtual production um, execution, right? And so and we brought like with part of our team and some of the most talented virtual production supervisors that there are there's out there. Yeah. yeah. Super cool. Um, right. So that on the client side, um, and all clients, I was a client for many years. Mm, and right. this is something you know that I like. really want to point <laughs> out because uh, I was a client for about 19 years or 18 years. So when I opened CashFrame, I said, I want to create a studio that behaves the way I would have liked my vendors to behave mm. right and give me the things that the way i would have liked to receive things from my vendors and uh, and that's always trying to think about that because i i was in that seat for many years many many years and some of my colleagues and friends right now are people that i was their client for a long right. time right <laughs> and and now the things are you know the stories are flipped that's why uh, this this industry is so tiny, right? And everyone knows each other. But yeah, yeah. So uh, I was in that seat for a long time, and, and now I'm in the other one. And I try to act as I would have liked to be treated as a client. Yeah, golden rule, everyone. <laughs> Treat <laughs> everyone the way you'd like to be treated. Yeah, true. That's true. Yeah. All right, let's pick another project. Uh, for example, the football one, which is there. Mm -hmm. It's it's uh, right it's an interesting yeah. one because. That was an internal project. It started as an internal project. Mm -hmm. um, but this was one of the ones that I said, you know, um, and this is one of the things that I'm actually excited about on Real Fest. I know that I'm getting ahead, but <laughs> uh, I started, when I started this like a conception and thinking about this project last year, it was like, I want to reach the point in which you can have cinematic looking openers broadcast that are real time, that are rendered in real time. And that time uh, I worked with Epic in some marketing thing and we called them broadcast cinematics. And they actually released uh, some uh, article about it in which we were talking about like, that we were pushing the concept of broadcast cinematics. And it was this idea of, it's not the time anymore to have this like, uh, that your opener is a fixed piece of media now you can have openers that you can actually have editorial content on it. And this, this was our attempt to show the market and show the broadcasters that this is an opener that could stand as an opener of a, of a, of a, a show that is cinematic, that has quality, but that you can change in real time the teams. So if you go down, there's like one slider that you can move from one to the other, like go a little bit more down, maybe we load, uh, no, there, one, we go. there, yeah. there you go. This one? So, yeah. so basically like you could, this was the entire opener, the entire cinematic, but with one click, you could pick which teams were going against each other, right? So the, in, and this was just as an example for us to show, and also with the crowd, the entire, 
I think it was 120,000 uh, characters, right? Yeah. And you, with one click, you will change entire teams that were playing against each other, right? So, I, and I keep, and I saw that somewhere in Unreal Fest, there's something about like, as well, like uh, cinematics and TV-matics or something that, like that they're, they're calling them. But it's the same concept, like let's push now the vision that a uh, real time doesn't mean less quality. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that you can achieve very, very big things. And I think that's the next era of entertainment in, in graphics. Right? And yeah. We're actually witnessing it right now. This project makes me really happy because to me, it feels like the more um, enhanced version of a project that we actually have talked about on the podcast before back in 2018. Um, we did a project for Intel that was really just about showcasing the power of the uh, i9 CPU before it came out. And so we made a virtual stadium and we filled it with as many people as we could at the time. Um, but there was always this desire like, oh, I wish we could get more than, you know, I think we had like 2000 people in there. But something like this is such an incredible crowd simulation and really does a wonderful job of pushing the limits. And we also had a similar thing with like, let's change the sports jerseys and make everyone do the wave. Um, I, I'm curious too, because you've done a lot with crowds like what are some of the lessons you've learned about how to pull that off in a compelling way well i've, I've always been a fan of dynamics mm. um of particles and i've always said particles are your friends <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah uh i think that um i mean some of the things we've learned with with the idea of crowds is it's a, how optimized dynamics can be against anything that is that is uh, actually unique right like uh, static static meshes skeletal meshes or any actors in in any uh, actors or we call them actors right um mm -hmm. in the in the scene um and how with Sim like simple is better, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of trickery when it comes to real-time graphics. Overall, like I think that probably the biggest advice that you can give like people that are getting into real-time graphics is learn tricks. Because if you talk to a lot of, of people that you see this amazing cinematic, hyper-realistic stuff, and then you pull the camera around, you saw that a lot of those things were cards or, or things that were pre-rendered and things like that. The same thing with dynamic, with, with the particles. Like there's a lot of things that you can make look very good using things like Niagara or using mm -hmm. like instant instance meshes or hierarchical instant meshes. I think like that, that you don't necessarily lose the quality um, or sacrifice the quality, right? And there is a thing in, in, that happens a lot in ICB effects when you are, when a director comes for the, from the first time and they see the screen, they're like, oh, that doesn't look hyper real when you see it in the screen, right? And it's usually that you have to see it through the camera, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's that, that thing that, that little gap that uh, with some, with good trickery, you can make things look through the lens real, real, right? And unreal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> To turn a to coin a phrase, to coin um, a phrase. yeah, you're reminding me a little bit of um, some of the animators for Into the Spider Verse. I, I know we're not talking about movies right now, but mm -hmm. like they would talk about how to achieve some of the looks for that. They're using very simple like blocks, and they're thinking about motion blur and like as the camera's moving, you can absolutely sell the effect of various things like a, a huge crowd using very very simple tricks. You don't need to have every one of these people here be a fully modeled you know two gig gigabyte metahuman or anything like that. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, and this is this is a fun, that's a fantastic example because Spider in the Spider Verse was such a revolutionary technique with the depth, right? Yeah. They, they mm -hmm. developed like this offset of color to signify depth, and but it, and and what I love about it is that it was such a good effect <laughs> that wherever you see it afterwards. It's like, oh, it's the Spider-Man effect. <laughs> yeah, right. Right? Yeah, it's like bullet time with the Matrix. It's a bullet like, time. Yeah, it's just, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's exactly like, doesn't matter what you do, you will always think it's Spider-Man because it was so nicely done. Yeah. And yeah, and it's simple. It's, mm -hmm. it's thinking about what is the user going to experience, not what the artist 
wants to create. Mm -hmm. And the right. user, we perceive that by offsets of colors. And, and so it was genius. Whomever came up with that, I don't know, but uh, it was fantastic. Like, okay, let's offset color to, to signify that. I think it was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. so cool. All right. Um, one more question before we dive into UEFN. Um, sure. Kexframe is an Unreal Engine authorized service partner. We've talked a little bit on the podcast before about like different authorizations, authorized training center, authorized instructor. There's a few more coming down the docket. Um, but could you educate our audience a little bit on what it means to have the very lofty title of authorized service partner? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the Unreal Engine service partner is a program that we entered about two years and a half, maybe two years. Um, and now we are gold service partners. Yeah. Um, and, and basically it's, it's some sort of cross cross promotion with Unreal Engine, right? So basically they, uh, they know that we utilize Unreal Engine in most of our projects and that we push the use of, of Unreal Engine in our project. Push is probably a strong word, but we, but we uh, suggest and we are present with Unreal Engine in our projects. And at the same time, they uh, promote us as a specialist of being a, a specialist of their system, right? And within that, you need to complete a series of questionnaires and exams, and they actually <laughs> take it very seriously. And they, they, they go through, you go through an entire process in which they can actually certify that you're a specialist in it and mm. to which level of specialty you are. And then from that point, uh, it works as that. They, it's, it's a part of a referrals program in which their clients go to Epic Games, especially like big companies that they are not in our industry completely immersed. And they go to Epic directly and they say, uh, we, want a, we want MetaHumans, right? Mm -hmm. For example, that was one of the, of the things that we started working on heavily due to our referral. Um, a, a ref Epic sent us a referral that said was we want hyper realistic metahumans, uh, and we had a lot of expertise on metahumans because of the talk we did in 2019. So, um, can someone do it, right? And we were like, sure, <laughs> we'll we'll do hyper realistic metahumans, and we started working on that based on a referral, right? And yeah. since then, that that referral has been our client for already like two years. Or something like that, but that's more or less how it works. It's like kind of a cross promotion. I believe that now is going through our uh, overhaul, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, of what what is the shape of it? I trust that uh, uh, the people that are in charge are super smart and super nice as well, <laughs> and, uh, and they are fantastic. And they, I'm sure they're going to be a fantastic work, but it's going through an overhaul right now to see where it fits in terms of the referrals versus how much Epic is involved in the process with the client. And how, because part of the process right now is that the client needs to fill a survey that comes from Epic, right? And that is very difficult as a vendor to tell your client like, hey, you have to go and fill out this survey after we finish a project. After they finish, no one wants to hear about the project anymore, especially broadcasters, <laughs> right? They, they probably spent... Done. <laughs> yeah, they were like, let's put the page, that's it. So I, I believe it's going through a little bit of an overhaul when it comes to that. But um, yeah, I mean, so far we've been lucky to be, to be part of in there. Yeah. And, um, and as you can see, we are a, kind of an Unreal Engine, I call it Unreal Engine 360 type of... Mm -hmm. Sure. Company in which we want, we like to get into all aspects of Unreal Engine. Mm -hmm. um, hence UEFN. Yeah, great segue. So let's let's set the stage. Uh, you're running this amazing company. You're working on really cool projects for clients. You're doing your own R and D and showcases of what can be done with Unreal Engine. And over here on the side is all the stuff going on with Fortnite and Unreal Engine, or, or the modified Unreal Engine Fortnite editor and uh, Fortnite Creative. And what's what's the draw of that? What starts to get you to turn your head a little bit toward this this other action going on that's related to Unreal Engine, but a little bit uh, tangential as well? Well, I think I think my my big curiosity started when I, in during Unreal Fest last year, 
mm-hmm. when I noticed that a team swinging he gave the, the 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 talk about Unreal Engine, and I noticed or perceived the the big emphasis on on Fortnite, right? I mean, he was very yeah. blunt about it. He said <laughs> straight away, like, <laughs> "This is what Fortnite we're is on. the one that is maintaining. <laughs> Fortnite is our priority." Like, okay, fantastic. Yeah. So I was like, "Well, let me let me uh, give it a switch in my head and start seeing Unreal as a gaming engine as well, and not only as a graphic gen- re- like real time rendering engine." And let me see what what's about that. So uh, I started talking with my team. And and uh, we got super 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 talented people uh, involved with us, and um, actually we were working on the Super Bowl, and uh, Lowen Lewis, which is which is our director of gameplay right now, uh, he he was like very very passionate about that, and then we had some conversations, and we became kind of partners in crime, and said like. Okay, let's push it. Let's make a game. But we said we have two conditions to do to get into this, this uh, sphere. One is that I don't want it to look as the typical <laughs> UFN game, right? Yeah. I want it to have. I want to bring a little bit of our expertise in like visuals uh, to this this uh, ecosystem. And the second one is that I don't want to do something like we have to innovate. We have to find something new. We didn't know what it what, what it was gonna be at that time, but we said that we have to find something new. I don't want to jump in a trend. I don't know if you know more or less how uh, the UEFN trends work, right? But usually, someone comes up with an idea of a map, and then there's like a million maps that are exactly the same thing, it's just like different. Someone came yeah. with with like a only up, which was a, mm-hmm. a map that you will climb up. And then there was like 2 million of the same one, right? So I said, like, I don't want to follow just the trend. I want to I wanna create something new. So a new style of gameplay, a new thing. And after a lot of, like, all my team, we gathered and we started debating about it. And it's like, okay, what do we do? And we landed on crowd. Like, we've been doing crowd for a while. Like, let's try it. You know, let's, let's, but for the first question is, can we actually bring a very large crowd into UEFN? And so we started doing tests. And I remember exactly the, the day that we saw like a hundred thousand uh, people crowd in real time, 120 FPS in UEFN. And we said, we got it, right? <laughs> Let's do something related to crowds. But our first idea was that we were going because um, our one of our um, goals with getting into UEFN is that at the end we we are a service company, so we wanted to train ourselves to do services in that field. So basically, creative services of creating islands for clients, for for brands, and and so on. So our first idea was that this crowd we were going to use them for concerts. We said like we can create concerts for any artist and we put all the this massive crowd and they are dancing and they are doing whatever they, we want them to do. Um, but then we started like digging more and more in how how much we could control the crowds. And then we realized that we that we could develop a lot of control of them and that they could follow you and they could like kind of fight you and we're like, oh, oh my God, we have something very interesting here. And that was the beginning of that. But I preface this by saying that um, the the core idea was at the beginning was not a game. It was training ourselves for services, right? Which we are <laughs> now <laughs> after all this stuff. But uh, but then it ended up being something. And I believe that the best projects usually happen like that, just out of um, passion and dedication, and we didn't even have it planned, and it suddenly happened. Yeah. And what's the timeline been like from that initial conception of this project to uh, a week ago or, or whenever it finally launched officially? Around four months and a half. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, and was that around... planned out? Like, did you did you do a four month kind of timeline and kind of hit um, all the different beats, or was it kind of a side project when you didn't need to be focused on client work? That that is a, that is a great question. Um, 
at the beginning we at the beginning we thought that we could dedicate a well at the beginning we had to dedicate only partial time right we we had other projects going on so we couldn't dedicate all the time um but then when we started realizing that it started becoming we wanted to add more and more functionality and more and more things uh, we realized that it had to become a full-time project so then we kind of separated the team and we created like this team that was only dedicated to that um because there's there's a heavy amount of of development on that on and uh, so then uh i mean uh, logan and his team we were leading all the kind of the heavy burst coding and all that stuff and uh, and the core cache frame we were more dedicated on like making it look and all the conceptual and story and like all that stuff so we we kind of a team up on the two sides of the coin, but the verse side was dedicated full time, and the artist side was not totally full time. But then at the at the very end, it became both full time. In the last, I would say, month and a half, it was it was a full time project for everyone. Yeah, and we wanted to draw. We wanted to like actually create the concept by hand and making sure that it was an actual process like a like a real art project right and not um, um just using just assets or existing environments uh, we wanted to simulate a real case scenario of a client coming to us and saying i want hmm. this specific art direction with this specific stuff yeah so let me um, brag on your behalf for a second about how amazing I find this experience, especially coming from a team like yours, where like I would expect it to look beautiful. I would expect it to be cinematic. There are certain things where it's like, yes, I expect there to be a narrative component that's working really well. Um, I did not expect a team like yours to create something that is so addictive from a gameplay perspective like there is so much going on with this and i love the way that you start off in kind of this chase mode you're running away from things you settle into this building and then there's all these different things going on where there's waves of of these guys coming in and then in between each wave you're trying to very frantically like do these other tasks and you've just created this gameplay engine that works really well I, i've mentioned to a number of people that like when you kindly sent this over to me i was thinking like i really don't have time to play this right now but i really want to see what arturo and his team have been up to so i was thinking like i'll play it for like five minutes i'll just get like a little taste of it and then get back to work and I ended up going for 45 minutes <laughs> uh which was like i you know 30 minutes and i'm like i really need to get back to work and i'm like i'm just gonna do this one more thing, one more thing, one more thing. <laughs> and then I made it to the second floor and I was like, okay, that at least seems like a, a good pause point. And then you told me that there's a save feature, which I'd never seen in UEFN before. Like anytime I've seen anything like a map where there's clearly like meant to be some level of progression, it's always felt like a you're going to go as far as you can in this one shot. And then if you want to come back to this map, you're going to start from the beginning again. So I'm throwing kind of a lot of uh, questions into the ether here. But like, you know, the save feature, that's incredible. The gameplay is incredibly addictive. Tell me a little bit about that development cycle and how you leveraged the skills you knew you had, but then also clearly were tackling a lot of things that were quite uh, new. How did you figure out what was going to work and what didn't? And what did that iteration process look like? Well, I mean, first of all, we, we knew we, we will all... Uh, most of the people that we were involved in the process, we played a lot of games, right? So we, yes. we, we knew what could potentially be entertaining. And, and we also, um, uh, when there was research about, okay, <laughs> what is usually entertaining and what can be, can be, can be done. And um, also a lot of trust in the kind of the younger side of the team on like what is actually working in the UEFN ecosystem. because. Uh, myself and all other artists, we were, coming, we were coming from the mentality of like big games, right? Like, oh, um, I don't know, God of War and Demon Souls and like all these things like that you had like very complicated narratives and all this stuff. And uh, luckily there was also the other side of the team, which were like more uh, uh, UGC Fortnite users were like, no, there's tycoons and then there's these things that are like kind of in a simpler and more like iterative way. And we kind of landed in between. 
Mm -hmm. So that was a, and I do believe, and I'm not saying this because it's our game. I, it's also very addictive to me. Like sometimes <laughs> I, I was telling my team, like when I, when I have a, a, a little bit of time, just like sit down and just go with it because it's a, is this, is this a iteration, even though I've seen this project for such a long time and so many headaches and so many crazy things, but I enjoy so much just going through, through the cycle of it like killing, like wiping out. It's like, I feel like I, I call it the cleaning effect, right? You wipe out and then you start over and then you wipe out again and so mm -hmm. on. So it's, it's, it's actually truly very entertaining. And <laughs> it's uh, a lot you like know, power washer. So funny, <laughs> fun, uh, fun fact, uh, we are, we launch on Friday oh, um, and our average play time is 43 minutes today. Yeah. So, um, and we were shocked by that. We're like, I mean, that means that from all the people that are playing it, I think we were in 6,000 or something like that uh, this morning that I checked. Um, wow. Like, the majority of people are staying around 40 minutes. Yeah. That to me is like, <laughs> wow, I mean, <laughs> this is insane. And actually, we are doing some adjustments. So we get them at when they are at 40 minutes. Again, we're going to introduce a few surprises. That are, when you're about <laughs> to leave, no. Hold on, we we'll get you back. <laughs> Jeez. Um, no work for you. Yeah. <laughs> Keep well, playing. That on, on that side. Now, on the safe side, uh, we knew, and this was something that we had this conversation early on in, in the team. We said, uh, and I remember having this meeting, which was kind of an intense meeting. We were in the middle of developing a million things. And, and I remember that, that the leaders of the project, we said, we need the safe feature. Because we have such a long experience uh, um, that it's going to be extremely frustrating for people to ending and then having to start from scratch every time. So the, I don't know if, if I don't want to give too much, but the, the game has multiple endings, multiple oh. possible endings. <laughs> um, so it, it, the ending of the game is different if you play by yourself, if you play two people and oh, wow. within yeah. those if you play in a kind of in an evil mode or you play in a friendly <laughs> mode and then there's another ending which is like very long which if you decide to play by speed or you decide to play by finishing all the possible hordes right and if if that's a, the case that you decide to end all the all the game it could be a four or five hour game right so we said we need to it's very important for the story and for the gameplay experience to be able to have the safe feature. Mm -hmm. uh, luckily, um, a, a relatively recent addition was uh, some persistence uh, tools in the UEFN uh, ecosystem that Epic released. So we were able to leverage those in order to, to develop the safe system. But, but yeah, I mean, it was, we knew that it was extremely important to do it. And we wanted to take it more. Right? When, when, when well, I was in the meeting, I was like, no, we have to, we want, uh, like, you know, we wanted like crazy abilities to save and like to do many things. But we settled, I think, in the perfect, which is like, you start when you, when you end it. Like if you got up to here, you can go and reload and start where you left off. Yeah. Um, so the persistent feature or the, the, the way that's set up. So it's, the saves are being saved on the Epic Cloud. You don't need to be like paying for AWS storage somewhere for everyone's uh, no, no, no. Saves. It's everything in their servers. So basically, you um, it's called a weak map, right? Mm. And and obviously, the, uh, I will uh, I will let my my team to go deep into into the very very minutiae what it, what it, how to structure it. But in simple terms, it's it's a, a it's a type of a variable or a type of uh, that you that you can relate a player ID to certain data, right? So then what we are doing is basically doing that. We say like, okay, this player ID, while ha things are happening during the game, we are basically recording their progress, and then when they leave, because we also it's not that they have to save. We wanted a way uh, in which you don't have to remember to save. You just leave and that's it, it's safe for you, right? Exactly. So it's basically all the time saving 
So then the moment you leave the session, we have exactly where you left. So then when you come back, we just basically query your, your, um, your user ID or your player ID, and we have all the chunks of data until the moment that you left. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that was not possible until relatively recent. So, That's excellent. Yeah. And with, uh, especially with the upcoming release of, of Fab, um, uh, Fab's already there for UAFN, it's coming more to Unreal and just kind of expanding. Um, it, would there be, regardless of whether you want to or not, would there be a way, if you wanted to, to kind of package up your save feature and make that into something that other UEFN creators could use? To package your save feature. Oh, I see, I see. The, what you have um, built, because it seems like something a lot of creators would love to have, yeah, but I don't yeah. even know if there's a way that you could like make that modular enough to, and, and sell it in a way that it could be easily handed off to others to use in their games. Well, I think I think that we, we have, I mean, we have gotten a, some, Requ not request, but some ideas of, uh, around mm -hmm. that. I mean, we are we are very happy to help the community, you know, in in many ways. I mean, that's how we got here. We right. a lot of the the things that we learned about UEFN, about Verse, about all these things, we learned from Discord, from from the community itself. Like, mm -hmm. and pff, I've said it in every single talk I've given in in this regard, right? Like the U the UE. Uh, a community is, is about helping each other, right? So we are happy to help. The I don't know if we could package it as a product or as something to, for someone else to use. It's just because it is so, so combined with our own code right now that uh, to separate it, we will have to spend some time making it something that is modular for someone else to take. Um, but I mean, helping the community, I mean, of course, I mean, this is how we got here as well. Yeah. Fantastic. And uh, do you by any chance, just would be kind of fun, no pressure. Do you by any chance have this project or anything from this project open in a way that would lend itself to a little bit of a tour, a little screen share? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, I can, I can uh, navigate through through the level. Excellent. Yeah, let's take a little look. We're going to get a little guided tour of this amazing new UEFN project. Awesome. Uh, hold on. Let me, oh, let me start from... Um, okay. So, I mean, this is it's a good idea because um, I think at least... It's good to see screen share the size of the map, right? Yeah, for sure. Which I know this is something that it is it is definitely um, something yeah. that might be interesting for a lot of people, right? Wow. So so this is this is a the map. <laughs> All these was like heavily, heavily art directed. Uh, by me and others, it was like <laughs> has to look like this. The lighting, ah! you know, yeah. you know how the craziness. Um, we have a, our little box guys all around. This is just, mm -hmm. of, of course, a small portion of them. Um, and if you if you click on one of them, I imagine you're not clicking on an individual one because there's some kind of Niagara thing going correct, on. There we correct. go. Yeah, this like is a, this is a Niagara. So we, we are. Relying heavily on Niagara, but also skeletal meshes, independent uh -huh. skeletal meshes. Um, it's difficult to say to which amount each one, but yeah. it's, it's definitely a, a combination between between both. But this is specific, I call them the fillers. <laughs> um, these are these are a Niagara system. Yeah. Wow. Um, and then, uh, so basically, for whatever who's played the game, you usually start down from here. And then this is where you, oops, sorry, you start mm -hmm. running, right? And uh, yeah, and I mean, things to comment about here is was mostly lighting and mood. I wanted to give it like a, um, a very a post apocalyptic idea, <laughs> yeah. right? That you will feel that something clearly happened. Um, but I didn't want to, I, I still want to be relatable. So we are doing a lot of high contrast between like re really, really uh, warm corners, but like really, really cold environment. 
um, and so on. Uh, and then also a lot of things that we learned during this process was like doing a signifying where to take the player, right? Where the player oh, yeah. needs to go. And this is very different to what we've done before because like we, we work in render things or we work in, in ICBFX that are like things that are super planned, but you don't know what the player is going to do. So mm -hmm. uh, a lot of research, a lot of uh, talking to people, very like big experts on, on that as well. And, and we learned a lot about how to drive the player where, whenever you want them, right? Yeah. And, and I wanted to find this moment in which, uh, I mean, we wanted to make sure to find this moment in, in which it was kind of uh, impressive, right? Like we could see our, our main protagonist, which is like still the horde, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and of course, as part of the story, uh, like the meteors that came and started everything. So this is kind of the kind of the back, the behind the scenes of the of the first. We call it the intro. Actually, originally the original idea of this was that we were going to have titles during this sequence, right? So you were going to be running, and you will be going to see like basically like. Uh, beginning titles of a movie you were going to yeah. see like uh, some of the credits uh, <laughs> at the beginning here and presented by cash frame and or like mm -hmm. something and then so people would understood that it was but we we realized that it was too conceptual for the players right mm. um and they will be lost i mean it was something that we had to learn a lot as well it was that at the end uh, our uh, we have two different clients, and we keep saying that in every meeting. We have one client that is uh, to show the industry that we can do services and we can take this to a, a higher level. Um, but also we have the actual players, right? We, I, we want, it to be, want it to be also a game, not a, just a showcase. So a lot of things change because of that. Yeah. Um, and then from here, you get teleported all the way, and here's where we can see the size of the map, right? That, that was a run. And then you get teleported all the way to our base, right? Mm -hmm. This is our lovely base. Um, uh, and then you start in here, right? Yeah. And this is where you come out of that elevator. And yeah, and this is basically our base as well, which we also brought this, this concept of these holograms um, in which I believe in the regular tycoons, you don't see this, what you are going to buy. It's more like mm. it's a surprise that what you're going to buy is like, yeah. but we wanted to let the, the player kind of see what they could aspire for. To, mm, yeah. you know? And so we developed the, a lot of custom shaders in which you will based on proximity and based on um, and, um, and condition a lot of conditional shaders and and things like that. But we wanted to okay uh, when they they can see I, they are not visible right now, but there are like these little dots that you can uh, maybe I can show them. Let me see. Uh, these little dots in which you can you know what what you need to buy next. Right. So all those little dots they tell you what's available for purchasing. Right. Right. And then, so yeah, it was a lot of like, a lot of feedback also for, from players on, okay, how do you know what to buy next and how do you know how, what to do next, right? Mm -hmm. And also things that will keep you entertained. As you say, in between hordes, there's a lot of things to do, right? Yeah. So this is uh, we're shooting range in which each one has a, its a reward available and the reward keeps growing as you progress <laughs> in the game. So you, you can make more and more money every time. I, I think I actually things. did. I did laugh out loud at the point I was getting so frantic with like, I would finish a horde, a wave, 
run over to the shooting range with like a pistol and try to like do everything I could and then go over and try to buy things. And then of course I had the realization like, Oh, wait a minute. I can just throw like a bunch of grenades or whatever in here (laughs) and you can finish the shooting range very quickly and then go over to do the other things. But that, that kind of spontaneous moment of like, "Ah, I don't have time to do the shooting range right now. And then realizing that was actually an effective strategy was kind of funny. Yeah. You're, you're discovering the secret (laughs) gems of the game. And also, and in some point, we were we realized that we have so many things to do, right? Because there's so many activities. There's a uh, dance floor. I mean, I don't want to give them all away, but there's like <laughs> things that you can, like there's dance floors and there's things that you can hit and, and these little chickens that come out and you can shoot them. And <laughs> so, or you can just sit and make money just sitting there and some stuff. But then we realized that we had so many activities that we need to give uh uh, the, 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 the player powers, superpowers, so they can buy them and use them as they need. So because this statue at the very beginning of the, of the concept, um, I think it's somewhere there in the behind the scenes, but this was just like a statue, you know? Yeah. It was just like uh, something that was going to be there and it was cool to look at and that was it. But then we, we decided to make it actually like powers. And like, if you buy different statues, you can get more health, you can get Ah. extra, extra passive income. Um, Or I think the other ones is, this is super speed. And and for example, for that, we realized that a lot of people end up running one side to the other very quickly. So then we put super speed, you buy this one, and then you can run from one to the other very quickly. Or this one is Ah. a very funny, I don't know if you played with this one, but this is a very funny one in which you you turn into a zombie uh-huh. so into you into one of them so then basically you get like a box head the same as them so yeah. then when you go and fight them here in the in the in the training center they don't see you they start oh. dancing <laughs> well i don't want to spoil it as well but they start oh, doing no. some yeah. stuff some funny wow. stuff because they think you're one of them so and then That's of amazing. course our protagonist which is up out here, right? Which is our our lo- lovely horde. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is something like that was the image when we saw at the beginning. I don't know if there's delay. Are you seeing the, the horde right now? Yeah, I see the horde. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. And I think there's some delay in the feedback. Um, yeah, this is something similar to this was the image that we saw at the beginning when we, when we said like, oh, this is going to work. Right. You know, like uh, we saw the crowd, we say, okay, we can actually do this and, uh, and it will work fine. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, like we wanted this, this moment when you are running out of, of your, your working here and you're running out and, and you look out, you see something massive. Yeah. And we wanted to convey that. We worked a lot, a lot in this environment outside and with lighting, fog, and very, very, very detailed uh, type of work in there. And also very important, we wanted to give enough armory, enough guns that people could have fun just upgrading the the way of doing that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you played with this one. This one is also a really fun one, but you have... This is in case you need more time. Oh, yeah. I'll read this out loud for our audio listeners. Use this lever to raise a wall to delay the horde from coming. Incredibly useful. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if, if you end up yourself and find out that you just want to chill because there's people that compete to be in the leaderboard. Yeah. And we've been impressed. Let me, let me go quickly to the leaderboard. It's in the third floor. And it's here. So we've been impressed with the inputs that we've gotten. Um, uh, these are developer times <laughs> still, but yeah. uh, these, these, all these are real scores. And we started getting from Georgia, from China, from a lot of players from Australia, New Zealand, wow. uh, that started submitting their, their record from Chile, Colombia. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and that that they want to be in the leaderboard, right? And this is yeah. this is just for um, if you are competing by speed, 
right? And then you are here putting the leaderboards. I'm glad we're also capturing the the records right now because you know it, this released on Friday. Today's Monday, so yep. it's only a few days later. If we look at this again in like a year or something, it'll be really interesting to oh, see yeah. where these numbers are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we were very, very happy that we suddenly started getting a, a records right away and and people that were playing it. But uh, yeah, so basically, this is it. You. I don't want to go to the last floor because this is where the surprises mm, are. Spoilers. But uh, basically, you go over these these floors and then you get to the rooftop, right? Where is basically the end of the game. Mm -hmm. um, if you are competing by speed. There's also, yeah. again, another ending if you just complete, just keep fighting the holes and over and over. Amazing. So we've had a, a few UEFN conversations on the podcast with um, JJ, a 504 creative, and um, Corey Williams talking about his experience with UEFN. Mm -hmm. um, to echo a few of those questions over to you, what were some of the, the unexpected challenges or things that made it easier than you expected? Um, I noticed our project size, I can't quite see, are we at 99% for project size? Oh yeah, we squeezed the last drop of memory. Yeah. That we could. I mean, we knew from the beginning that we wanted higher end graphics, higher end visuals. So I can tell you this, like we've been doing ICB effects bad for a long time. <laughs> and I have never took, taken optimization to the level that we had to right. with this. <laughs> like we, we had to take optimization to the next level. And yeah, we are... The project is, is we're using most of the memory um, that we can because there's also a lot of custom animations and the animations take a, long, a lot of memory. Um, yeah. Like if you notice all the bosses, they do multiple sets of animations. They, oh, yeah. They do tantrums and then they <laughs> throw stuff and then they like a lot of things, right? So uh, a lot of animations, a lot of custom animations for our cinematics. Um, including obviously in-game cinematics and ending cinematics and, and so on. And uh, so our memory went up. Now, in terms of the thermometer, um, it is a mystery of the world how that thermometer is calculated, right? Mm. I don't think anyone can tell us <laughs> uh, in reality what how that thing is calculated. So then we had to do a lot of a trial and error of like, oh, if you re remove this, we use a lot of uh, hierarchical static meshes, a lot of tricks to lo try to lower that. But uh, we encounter that in the same sessions, sometime the thermometer will just go up just because, right? Like yeah. Without adding anything. So I think that there's a lot of work still from from the yeah, on reels from the epic side on on make it, m making it maybe a little bit more predictable mm -hmm. for because a lot of studios one thing that i realized that a lot of studios like us are starting to get into this ecosystem and there's going to be more and more studios that come and because we are all starting to realize that there's a, a real potential for for projects here right yeah so uh, but the uncertainty of measuring things, calculating, um, it might, uh, studios might start pushing more for, we need a, a little bit more control of what we can create and, and memory and so on. So I think it's gonna, uh, it's gonna have to be a little bit tighter now that more professional studios are getting, because this has been the, uh, the field for independent creators for a long time. Right, Fortnite Creative, and now more studios are getting into it. So yeah. Well, um, it's incredibly inspiring. Um, yeah, and then uh, you know the algorithm, of course, is always a, a bit of a, a roll of the dice. And it seems like so far in the <laughs> three days this has been out, that it's been kind to you and it's getting a lot of really positive attention. Because that's the thing is like I knew that this was an amazing experience you guys had created, but it also felt like unless this is popping up in in people's feeds. Um, they're not going to be playing it. I knew that anyone who did play it would love it, but 
you are kind of beholden to the Unreal or the Fortnite gods to actually put this in front of people. So, um, well, I mean, was there anything are, you were able to do to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are still in the nervous stage. Sure. <laughs> uh, we don't know because what we did realize is that when we started, we started really, really strong. But the moment it got taken out of the of some of the channels, so we were yeah. in like hidden gems for like almost twenty four hours, uh, mm -hmm. uh, over twenty four hours. Uh, but then it got taken out, and suddenly we saw a drop in the players, right? Mm -hmm. um, which, uh, of course, we understand that they, that all, there's so many maps that they need to give chance to other maps to be shown. Um, but uh, we we applied for epic peaks. We are mm -hmm. very, we, we have uh, all our prayers <laughs> on, on, <laughs> on all the stuff that we can put to like, to get, to get, uh, hopefully get there. But we, um, but it is, we realize that it is, it is true what, what other ones, I know that Corey was talking about it a lot and with his map and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is true that you are at the mercy a lot of the algorithms. Uh, we are right now. Like we saw our our attendance dropping when we were not in one of those channels, and we're like, "Wow, this is very interesting." Like, it is very very dependent on like what what is promoted there, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's it has to be a balance of, um, and I think it's gonna be a strategy on Epic side of what where do where do they want to take the future of UGC in. In Fortnite, mm -hmm. they is, I'm sure there has to be some strategic conversation of saying, okay, we as a company, as the creators of the engine, as as the creators of this community, they want to take the direction on this, and it could be that is a trendy side of like these these millions of maps that are like very similar and so on, uh, or they could be like, okay, di different ideas, or let's try something different, like. It's gonna be completely on their end, right? So the studios that we, the studio artists that we are entering this market, we have to be conscious that this is something real, that we are taking the risk of of that you that we create this map and that it goes nowhere just because it was it didn't get the attention. I mean, yeah, and we knew we knew that risk from the beginning, and that's why. One of our techniques, our in all these, was um, let's make sure we train ourselves for services, for creative mm -hmm. services, and let's make sure that we create enough IP when it comes to coding that we can reuse in multiple of either those services or future maps. So one of the things that I admire uh, my team a, a lot about it, and they did a fantastic, fantastic job, is that uh, everything is extremely modular here, right? Everything is like, okay, these are this set of tools that we can reuse and that we can put in different maps as we keep going forward. So at least it was not uh, four and a half months <laughs> going to nothing <laughs> just because we were not picked by the algorithms. Yeah. So it, it is, there is a risk. So whomever gets into this, it's I would say, even if you create an amazing, amazing map, map it is very. It seems to me, as as someone starting this endeavor, that you are very dependent on what the algorithms um, do to you. Yeah. Is there a, a tagging system like? especially with what you created here, it seems like even though there aren't necessarily trends that this would be riding off of, if this had tags like Halloween, spooky, things like that, I would have to imagine as we get closer to Halloween that, you know, Epic would naturally start to promote more things that have that kind of holiday spirit. What's that process look like? I mean, you have a few tags um, when you post it. You have exactly four tags. And four then, tags, then, that's it. Yeah, four tags and then... Epic puts two more based on the type of of the description that you do a one. So you said in total display is their six tags. Um, and uh, 
And the rest is kind of self-promotion in terms of what you put in your content, what you um, what you describe, and your thumbnail. Mm-hmm. Um, which I've heard that this thumbnail is, a, is super important and we tried to create an attractive thumbnail, but there was like a huge back and forth between the creative side and, and, and the technical side of, on like, uh, do we make the thumbnail more like flashy and like right silly looking just to attract more attention or we make <laughs> do it you pretend that Spider-Man designed, it? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. So, and then I think we landed somewhere in between, um, but uh, there is that. And and in some point you are relying on your self promotion. That was that's why today I was fighting so much with Meta because <laughs> they they don't want they they they, they um uh, they don't want uh, to to accept my account for promotion. <laughs> yeah, but we'll oh, we'll get it solved. Somehow. That's really frustrating. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's obviously an incredible effort here. How many people to- in total have touched this project in some way? Uh, roughly. Six. Six people. Six. That's it. Oh my God! I thought you were going to yeah. say sixty, or you know, like no, yeah. No, no, there, no. I mean, there's, there's so many different talents uh, at play here. That's really incredible. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's it's. I think six people total between uh, design, uh, reading, uh, animation, verse coding. Uh, I mean, obviously, a, a lot of us play. A, a few hats, right? yeah, and um, a few dozen hats, <laughs> yeah, and uh, to the animation UI, yeah. So I would say the core team was six. We we outsourced a couple of things, but pretty minor. Yeah, I mean, six people, four and a half months to produce something like this, especially with other you know work going on. That's that's pretty remarkable. I think there's a lot of AAA studios that would be thrilled to be able to uh, produce something at this level of quality and uh, I want to say engageability with a much much larger team. So I think you're you're setting a really excellent bar here. I mean, we are we're all vampires right now. We haven't seen the light <laughs> <Yeah>. in <laughs> in a long time until last Friday that we released. Now we yeah. need to take vacation. This is actually my skin. This is, this is, uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. You actually don't have a shirt on right now. I don't have a shirt right now. This is actually my skin. No, yeah. no, no. It's, it's serious. We, we haven't, we, it's, it's, I have to say that I am extremely grateful and extremely proud and with, with, with my team because it has been such an incredible effort from everyone. And we were, it was so new to us that we were so passionate and so uh, excited to be doing this. And um, I hope it does well, and not on, not, and especially because I feel it will be amazing for the team to yeah. to feel that recognition and not, not, not. Obviously, yeah, if we make money out of it, fantastic. But also because it was so much effort and so much uh, put into it. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm extremely, yeah. extremely grateful and proud of that. Yeah, yeah, man. I'm rooting for you. I, I think um, it would be a shame if this becomes a, I mean, we, yeah, we had this discussion with Corey and just how kind of um, off put he felt by the whole UEFN process. And he's obviously an incredibly talented creator who might never touch UEFN again. And it would be a shame if, if we hear more stories like that, because there's obviously a lot of incredible passion and, and, Uh, artistry going on here and I I just want to see more of it you know less of the things that are clearly just like IP ripoffs in Fortnite and more of these these really wonderful um, original content with a lot of really clever new innovative ideas in it yeah and and I mean I keep I keep telling my team because in some point we've had good days and bad days good days that we are like yeah this is going to do amazing and and some of the days that nah no one's gonna play it you know normal process right and uh, I keep telling, well, uh, the stuff, the amount that the, the skills that we gain doing this are completely invaluable. Yeah. Like we truly, truly, truly got very, I, I feel that in this moment, we see any map, we've seen like the big concerts and all that. And pff, we see like, well, I mean, they're amazing. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but we say like, we could, we could take one rose, you know? Like I, I feel confident that we, uh, as the same way as we've taken other big projects, uh, when 
uh, on the broadcast and film and then all that side, I feel like, okay, we are ready. We are ready to take any of those, those with projects. So I always tell them, remember that we had two purposes with this, right? Yeah. Yeah, we had to create the map, but we were also training ourselves for, for what's to come. And we trained ourselves with something fantastic. Yeah, So absolutely. Well, we're having a, a wonderful discussion here. We definitely have to get you back for a part two at some point. Let's do our, our last uh, few final questions as a little bit of a rapid fire thing. Okay. Um, you've obviously got an incredible team with you. Arturo, if someone comes to you guys and says, here's $100 million to do whatever you want, what's that kind of dream project look like for you? That's a great question. Um, I think it's one that it's uh, 360 on mm -hmm. like i mean a dream project will be one in which i was uh, as our nature mm -hmm. if uh, our blood is to is to dabble in so many industries you know, and mm -hmm. so many types of projects if someone comes to us and say right right now like okay we want to do a full 360 a project with a big brand or something in which you're going to create a game and you're going to create around the game a promotion in ICBFX and around it you're going to create the graphics package and you're gonna, like a full 360 in which in which the we can extend and we can cross cross industry uh, cross um, yeah cross industry right so we cross from film to television to live to gaming to all that because we have double in all of them so one that will combine everything, I think that will be kind of my dream project right now. Yeah, that's excellent. And you've already been, I think, get, doing a great job of giving some uh, pearls of wisdom for up and coming creators. Um, anything else you'd like to throw out there is things that you wish you learned sooner for people who want to, you know, dive into UEFN, into Unreal, into broadcast, into 360 cross disciplinary um, content. Uh, what comes to mind? I mean, I, uh, I I I gave this talk in the in the fellowship and the bootcamp it's called not the yeah, fellowship right uh, and and uh, I put like our principles for that and I'll, I'll, it it was a funny graphic I can actually show you really quick oh great <laughs> uh, but it's it's truly and there's one of them that I think is the main one that I will give but I found this presentation while I was preparing for this and it was. It was our our. It it was our <laughs> acronym for that was like Imagine Bob, right? And this was our um, <laughs> uh, advice for all starting new projects. It was intention, modesty, story first, um, groundwork, impulse, neatness, uh, essential, be ingenious, outreach, and bond with people that you care. Wow. Um, <laughs> and I would say from that. I would say impulse, right? Like the biggest one is just do it. Like yeah, there's right. so much, just there's so many ideas that stay in ideas. Mm -hmm. There's so many projects that, that they go absolutely nowhere. They're so, and it's like, oh yeah, I would love. You, you know how many years I said, I told to myself, I would love to make a short film. Mm -hmm. An animated short film, right? I, I, I made millions of commercials, millions of animations, millions of all that uh, for clients. For but for so long, I was like, I want to do a short film, just like. Um, and then the moment that you get to do it, it's just like, oh, it was so easy, <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> so I would say that that is advice: just do it. Whatever is is the idea, just go and do it. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's a really good one. Oh man, so cool. Um, Unreal Fest. Uh, Arturo, will you be at Unreal Fest Seattle this I year? Will. I cool. will. So Looking I encourage anyone it. else to, yes, please uh, come find you. Uh, anything in particular you're looking forward to regarding Seattle, the city, the event itself, um, based on past Unreal Fests, anything like that? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the main one is the people. I am yeah. so excited to, to see, see, talk, meet, like people that are going through what we are going mm -hmm. and like a new new minds and seeing old friends and people that we haven't seen each other for a while and so on so that's that's one um the second one is the one that i mentioned before i'm really interested in seeing the 
the kind of the evolution of of uh, real time cinematics. Mm -hmm. Like what I saw, I saw in the plan that they are have the TV matics, and I don't know if it's related to that, but I hope it is. Uh, but that idea of like that we started pushing last last year of of the real broadcast cinematics that we call them. But that I would love to see the evolution. Um, of course, on real five point five, mm -hmm. um, like what's what's new? Yeah. I know like um, displacement, uh, skeletal mesh displacement, and all that stuff. Um, I want to see. I'm very curious about what's happening with the motion graphics side. Uh, I know. I, I think that Andy uh, changed uh, position. I don't know if he's still involved with that, but I do believe that what he created, like, is fantastic. So it was a fantastic uh, his initiative there. I don't know if it was only him. Of course not his team as well, but. Uh, from the very beginning when they start pushing that it was such a huge undertaking uh, especially in the live in the live uh, and broadcast industry that it's so tight with the common tools that they've been using for so long right and they are good tools so it was a very 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 uh, brave move from him so kudos to him a lot are um, we talking about Andy Blondin? Blondin yeah Great, fantastic, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, all the motion graphics stuff that he did, and I think it's picking up a lot, and it's going to different aspects now, and it's fantastic. Uh, and the last one is obviously UEFN. Of course. I want to see, I want to meet more people within the UEFN ecosystem. I want to hear from them what is the challenges that, that they have. And now that we are getting into this as well, I want to mm -hmm. hear, I want them to know me, from like maybe the new, the new kid in town that is like starting to learn. <laughs> well, well, trying to make about. some friends. Yes, I'm <laughs> yeah. trying to make some friends, and I'll bring a, you know, like my toys to play and all <laughs> right. that stuff. And and I want to hear more about what has been their experience and learn, and and uh, and get their opinion about what we are creating as well, because yeah. I think that we can partner with fantastic people that have been doing it for a long time. Yeah. And, and as you said, you know, Unreal Fest, it's the people who really make it such an incredible event. And in particular, it's the fact that you have so many people using Unreal Engine and UEFN in so many different ways. So you have this incredible pool of talent where sometimes you go to industry specific events where it's, you know, you're just with other people who deal with broadcast or a particular uh, software or whatever. And, and the Unreal Engine ecosystem, I think we both agree, is so full of so many talented people approaching the software and these tools from totally different perspectives oh, yeah. and it's so fun to engage with them and collaborate with them and show them what you're working on and get that feedback it's so nutritious <laughs> oh yeah it's insane like you turn around there's someone from automotive there's an architect and like and you can identify the architects and you can <laughs> yeah. identify the people are in gaming usually gaming is like more multicolor hairs and the architects are very well dressed and like you know like <laughs> you're like oh this is from you can play a game of guessing which industry they are from but yeah, yeah, everyone's colliding in the same, in the same space, and everyone's uh, sharing this common goal. So, especially now that all the industries are merging, right? That's why my dream project will be combining, like all those. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, any other events besides Unreal Fest that you'd like to know that you or your team members will be at? Will you be at like NAB New York or anything like that? Yeah, well, yeah, I think I'll I'll be in NAB New York. Um, maybe just just attend a couple of the talks and mm -hmm. uh, and just say hi to people. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and that's it. But uh, I I don't know. I don't know yet. Uh, usually the ones that I go is South by Southwest, Seagraph, um, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean Real Fest has been has been. <laughs> A mandatory as well for the last and NAB of course I always go to NAB mm -hmm. both NAB and uh, I uh, this IBC I, I usually go to IBC but I didn't make it this time but mm -hmm. because of right. pain <laughs> yeah you gotta so, gotta be your vampire self and yeah I, I had to vampire a bit more yeah, I like that you guys are just coming out of uh, the the dark with this right as we hit the fall solstice, and it's like getting dark at like six thirty p.m. now. I know. Like, yeah, I yeah. know. And, and you know what? It's it's uh, 
It was entire. It wasn't entirely planned to be a Halloween game, although we yeah. kind of knew. We're like, oh, maybe we land around Halloween, but I think it's perfect now. It's perfect oh, yeah. that it's like coming exactly at this time, and it had a Halloween theme through its inception. Yeah, so, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a bold prediction, which is that we're gonna see kind of an exponential curve, and as we get closer and closer to Halloween, we're gonna see this really take off. Um, that's what it deserves. I hope that's what happens. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I hope so as well. We have all our our hopes on that as well. And again, more more for the team. I think that team deserves that. We work really hard on it. Yeah. Um, Arturo, where can people find you? Where can people find more information about Cashframe? Um, so, I mean, me, uh, Arturo.brena at Cashframe.com. Mm -hmm. Cashframe is K-E-E-X frame. Kicks frame or... <laughs> That's or definitely what I called it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, in, in, the, in the website is same, cashframe, kicksframe.com. And um, we are in every single platform and there is now this, we have this new, this new division. We, want, we, we didn't want to kind of mix entirely the, the services for, for entertainment with the gaming. So we are creating this new kind of handle and everything that is called Cash Interactive. Mm. which is mostly kind of the interactive side of Cashroom, right? So it's going to be gaming and maybe other other stuff that gets thrown into that. But uh, both know that both reaches us, right? They will get to us, but we are trying to keep them clean, mostly for the client, so they don't get confused of what's what. Mm -hmm. So yes. it's, it's Cash Interactive or Cash Frame in any platform. Right. And I almost forgot to ask, um, are there any shout outs to any other creators, mentors, people, companies doing cool things that you would like to just um, give more voice to? Uh, I mean, oh, my God, there are so many. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um, a few that come to mind. <laughs> I mean, I, I really like what I already, already been chewed has been mm -hmm. doing. Um, I mean, I, all that, those guys are fantastic. And they are doing fantastic work, mostly not in the or not so much in the retail. And we had we gave a we gave a talk together um, in for SVG, mm -hmm. and we were talking about a kind of Unreal and so on. We so we had a, a few a little bit of exchange on on uh, tips for Unreal and and so on. But uh, I love their work. I think they are fantastic. Um, I mean, I would say. Uh, a lot of my, what my team members are doing on their own as well. Like it's, mm. it's a lot of very cool stuff. Um, I mean, uh, Logan Lewis is uh, our gameplay director now. He's he's been doing so much cool stuff in UEFN for a long time, and he's he's kind of a genius on that. Mm. He's been doing a lot. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of my team. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, for all the studios, absolutely. I mean, Astus Media, I love what they are doing. In, in I don't know if you've seen what they do mostly with with Unreal and with other um, they they are rebrands for for I think Al Jazeera and like and other other networks. There they are doing fantastic, fantastic stuff as well. Is that these guys? No, Astus. 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 Sorry, spell it. A S T U C E Media. Ah, okay. Great. Well, we're also giving a shout out to Astros Media too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why <laughs> not? Astus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Them, cool. Them, them, them. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. They they also do fantastic stuff and and uh, uh, good friends of ours. We've collaborated in a few projects before. And, and yeah, and they are, they are most on the broadcast side and they do mostly broadcast stuff, but, yeah. but very, very well done as well. And really graphic, also graphic, they do amazing. Oh stuff. yeah. Yeah. Those guys are great. We had our, our little um, cloud computing platform for a while called uh, Giraffical. And so we learned about Giraffic because we were looking for things that had a similar name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah <laughs> They're yeah. very cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they, they uh, again, they, it's, it's very on the broadcast end, but I know what it takes to do broadcast projects 
and it's not easy. <laughs> yeah. So uh, a lot of my admiration to all that. I know that Tiago was, I think he's working with them now mm-hmm. as well. Tiago, fantastic as well. Yeah, so, yeah, we're gonna get Tiago on the podcast. <laughs> oh yeah, you you you've we'll, run, we'll get some run? stories. We're, oh. we're, yeah, he'll be on this season. <laughs> ah, okay, okay, fantastic. Yeah, he has good stories. Yeah, yeah, Very fantastic. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, as we wrap up, um, just a quick bit of housekeeping. Um, yes, please come say hi to Arturo and I and uh, the Agile Lens folks and the Cash Frame folks at Unreal Fest. Um, reminder, we have three talks at Unreal Fest. We're doing Intro to Augmented Reality, Intro to the Variant Manager and Configurator Templates, and uh, Mind the Gap, uh, going from Unity to Unreal Engine. So if anyone feels more comfortable in Unity right now but wants to move over into Unreal Engine, come check out those labs. Um, also, our Authorized Training Center has an Apple Vision Pro for Unreal Engine course coming up. That is going to be 10 10 10 October 10th at 10 a.m. Uh, so please join that at alexcoulombpresents.com if you are interested. The first course will be free, and then we'll get progressively more advanced and more expensive. I don't know. We'll see how that works. Um, besides that, uh, thank you so much, Arturo. This was a fantastic conversation. I have been looking forward to this for a while and thank you for all you do and all the incredible work that you and your team are putting out there in the world um it's a pleasure and an honor let's try to do a high five <laughs> uh, let's see wait hold on oh, uh, this one this side. i'll hold there still there, uh, 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 my, uh, my hand is so big hold on there yeah go. there we uh, go uh, uh, uh pr- pretty close there pretty close go. great we there did it go. all right yeah. that'll probably be the thumbnail yay episode one complete um, thanks again to uh, Vikas Reddy and the Light Twist Team for our studio. Thanks to Alan, our producer. Um, hello to Jacob, who is off traveling about. We'll get him back soon. And everyone, farewell. Have a good night and see you soon. Cheers. Thank you so much for the invite. <laughs> yeah.